Have you ever read As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner? Faulkner was an American writer who earned the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1949 for his extensive contributions to American and in particular Southern literature. He also won multiple Pulitzer Prizes over his lifetime for his writing. He wrote and published As I Lay Dying in 1930, and it proved to be one of his most famous and influential works. As I Lay Dying is a black comedy and southern gothic novel which tells the story of a deeply flawed, eccentric, and poor family, the Bundrens, as they attempt to deal with the death of their mother, wife, and matriarch. Much of the novel defies a simple explanation, so I won't even bother to attempt it here. But suffice it to say that if you really enjoy dark humor and absurdity, then As I Lay Dying may be the perfect book for you. For this work, Faulkner pioneered the use of stream of consciousness writing and multiple narrators. Indeed, the narrator varies from chapter to chapter. The narrator of one of the most memorable chapters is Vardaman, the youngest Bundren, who is somewhere between seven and ten years old. Throughout the novel, Vardaman struggles with the death of his mother. It is his first experience with the concept of death. He doesn't understand it, and no one in his family bothers to explain it to him. They are all simply too busy with their own problems and scheming. At one point, Vardaman is so confused about death and why his family has put his mother inside a coffin that he begins to grow concerned that she won't be able to breathe and add some breathing holes to the box. At another point, the coffin with his mother still inside it falls into a river and then floats downstream with her still inside of it. Because Vardaman still doesn't comprehend this situation and doesn't understand why his mother won't speak to him and why she is now floating down river, he can, comes to the only reasonable conclusion for a seven to 10 year old to make. His mother is a fish. This is one of the most famous and silly chapters in As I Lay Dying, and perhaps it is one of the most famous chapters in all of literature as a whole. Five simple words narrated by Vardaman. My mother is a fish. As I mentioned, As I Lay Dying is an absurd book. But I'm often reminded of this chapter whenever I start to think about the evolution of vertebrates, fish, and people. Ask a paleontologist or a biologist what they think about Vardaman and they would probably tell you that he was mostly, but not entirely correct. You see, in fact, we are all technically fish. Every one of us, each and every human being, we are all fish. Yes, we are bipedal hominids, and yes, we are primates. We are hominids and primates, but we are also reptiles, amphibians, tetrapods, and fish. We also belong to the class Mammalia and the phylum Chordata. We wear many hats and are many things all at once. We are many things including fish. You know what a fish looks like, and we don't look like fish at all. So your instincts is to separate fish from everything else. But think about it in terms of a phylogenetic tree. We don't identify clades based solely on extant living taxa. We also consider extinct species, transitional forms, and other ancestors. We consider the evolutionary history of life. For example, the class Mammalia, the mammals, us included, include all living species that share one common ancestor. This common ancestor had all of the characteristics of a mammal and passed these characters onto its descendants. In other words, 
Mammalia is a crown group. It includes all of the extinct and extinct species with the defining characters of mammals. Now, what if we apply the same reasoning and same logic to fish? What does the group of fish look like? This phylogenetic tree shows the evolutionary relationships among mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. As you can see, there are many types of fish, including lobed fin fish and ray fin fish. If one attempts to identify a crown group or a monophyletic clade that includes all living fishes, as well as their ancestors, both living and extinct, then one must include mammals, reptiles, and amphibians in it. We call this group Osteichthys. So to be 100% correct, Vardaman should have said that we are all Osteichthys, including his dearly departed mother. But to be fair, we are all Osteichthys is not quite as memorable. In any case, if you could trace the lineage of our species backward through time, generation by generation, you would find that our ancestors lived in the water where life evolved in the first place and had many of the characters that we see in modern fish. No, we did not evolve from tuna or salmon. That would be incredibly unlikely. So you don't need to worry about eating a long lost relative the next time you sit down for a meal. It is safe to say that our fishy ancestor has long been extinct. But if this ancestor were still alive today, we can be fairly certain that we would still call it a fish. So where did fish come from? When did they evolve? And when and how did life begin swimming throughout the water column of our planet? Before we can answer these questions, we need to talk about a few other groups. The Osteichthys include fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Along with sharks and some other animals, they make up a group called the vertebrata or the vertebrates. The vertebrates in turn belong to the phylum chordata. All chordates have a few characters in common. Pharyngeal slits, post anal tails, hollow dorsal nerve cords, and notochords. The most important characters are the notochord and the hollow dorsal nerve cord. Both of these features run the length of the chordate body. The notochord is a flexible rod. Its composition depends on the animal, but it is usually consisting of bone, cartilage, or a similar material. In all cases, the notochord provides skeletal support for muscles. It provides a rigid but flexible support system for muscle attachment. It plays a key role in guiding the development of an organism from its juvenile to adult stage. The hollow dorsal nerve cord runs along the length of the notochord on the dorsal side from the posterior end of the organism, its head, to the, its posterior end, or anus. All vertebrate animals have special notochords and dorsal nerve cords. They also all have craniums or skulls with paired sensory organs. For this reason, vertebrates are also known as craniates. As a vertebrate matures, its notochord gets replaced by a segmented series of stiffer elements called vertebrae. The vertebrae are made of bone or cartilage. These vertebrae are separated by discs, which create joints and allow for mobility. It are these vertebrae and discs that make up your backbone or spine. If your discs wear down or become dislocated, 
you may begin to develop discomfort or back problems. The vertebral column grows and surrounds the dorsal nerve cord as the organism develops. Ultimately, the dorsal nerve cord becomes the nervous system of the spinal system, running the length of the backbone and connecting at the top to the brain. Although all vertebrates have notochords, dorsal nerve cords, and skulls, they can be further subdivided into a number of groups. There are vertebrates with jaws, and there are vertebrates without jaws. Jawless vertebrates are called agnathins, and they include animals like hagfish and lampreys. This lamprey has vertebrae, a spinal cord, and a cranium, but it does not have a hinged jaw. Instead, it has a toothed, funnel-like sucking mouth, which it may use to latch onto other organisms and suck their blood. They are like little vampires. Indeed, many lampreys are parasites. Vertebrates with hinged jaws are called nathostomes. The nathostomata are far more diverse than the agnathins, and today they include over 60,000 species and represent 99% of all living vertebrates. They all have jaws and two sets of paired appendages. There are two main groups of jawed vertebrates. The first, of course, is the osteichthyes, us included. Again, this group includes fish, tetrapods, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. The other group of jawed vertebrates are the chondrichthyes, which includes sharks and their close relatives, stingrays. Although the osteichthyes and chondrichthyes both have hinged jaws and two sets of paired appendages, their backbones and skeletons are quite different. Osteichthyes are also called bony fish because they contain skeletons that are primarily composed of bone, a material consisting of proteins, collagen, polysaccharides, and most importantly, the mineral apatite. In chondrichthys, sharks and rays have skeletons made of cartilage, not bone. This is why they are sometimes called cartilaginous fish. Cartilage does not contain any minerals. It consists entirely of proteins, polysaccharides, and other biomolecules, like collagen. In your body, you can find cartilage in your joints, at the tip of your nose, and in your ear. Cartilage is not as hard or as rigid as bone. So, now that you have a better understanding of chordates, let us return to the questions at hand. Where did fish come from? When did they evolve? And when and how did life begin swimming throughout the water of our planet? The oldest possible chordate fossils have been found in lower and middle Cambrian rocks of the Burgess Shale, Chen Zhang, and other Burgess Shale type Lagerstaten around the world. This species from the Burgess Shale is called Picia gracilinus. Although its affinities are a matter of debate, Simon Conway Morris placed Pichia among the chordates in 1979 after finding remains of a fossil with a notochord. Interestingly enough, he also found evidence that Pichia had a cuticle and tentacles, which do not occur among modern chordates. If Pichia is a chordate, it means that this phylum evolved during the Cambrian explosion. That said, we cannot yet rule out the possibility that Pichia belongs to a stem group of Chordata 
or alternatively may not have been a chordate-like animal at all. There is also some evidence to suggest that vertebrates and craniates evolved during the Cambrian explosion. This fossil, called Haukuikthes from Chenjiang, appears to include remains of eyes and possibly some of the other characters of chordates. If so, it would probably be a vertebrate or a craniate. However, again, the evidence is a little questionable, and there is an ongoing debate about the affinities of fossils such as these. The oldest reliable evidence of chordates and vertebrates occurs in the Ordovician. These microfossils are called conodont elements. They come in a variety of shapes and sizes, but most of them are less than a millimeter in length. The oldest conodont element fossils occur in Cambrian rocks, but the best examples occur in the Ordovician. These fossils are very abundant in some places, and overall their fossil record spans from the Cambrian to the Triassic. Conodont elements look a lot like teeth, but for many years, paleontologists did not know what sort of animal produced them. The animals commonly and frequently shed their elements over their lifetime, scattering them along the seafloor. So today, the elements are now almost always found by themselves. Although the fossils of conodont elements are very common, the fossils of the conodont animals themselves are rare. It took paleontologists many years of searching before they discovered any fossils of the conodont animals themselves. Eventually, paleontologists did find a fossil of a conodont animal with its conodont elements still located in its mouth. We now know that each conodont animal left behind fossils of many different types of conodont elements. Although the conodont elements look like teeth, they were actually pieces of a complex feeding apparatus, which was part of the mouth of a fish-like animal. In each animal, the feeding apparatus consisted of many pieces and parts. It was not a simple hinged jaw like you might find in a nathostome. This tells us that the conodont animals somewhat resembled lampreys. They did not have hinged jaws, but there is clear evidence that they did have a notochord, dorsal nerve cord, and cranium. They were certainly fish of some kind. Besides conodont animals, there were many other jawless fish in the Ordovician and Silurian. Another major group of jawless fish were the ostracoderms, which lived during the Ordovician, Silurian, and Devonian periods before they went extinct. Paleontologists aren't entirely sure how ostracoderms are related to modern jawless fish because they have an, an unusual character, armor. Ostrochoderms were some of the first animals on Earth to evolve bony skulls, and unlike other chordates of the time, ostrochoderms did not use their gills for feeding, only respiration. They were predators, unlike any alive today. Yet another unusual group of extinct fish from this time were the placoderms. Like ostrochoderms, Placoderms were also covered in armor and lived during the Silurian and Devonian before going extinct. But unlike ostracoderms, placoderms had real jaws and probably evolved them from modification of gill arches over time. Placoderms were some of the largest predators of the Devonian period, but they were not alone. Most 
groups of sharks and rays probably evolved during the Devonian period. And many different varieties of osteichthyes, including both lobe and ray fin fish, also diversified during the Devonian. For these reasons, the Devonian is often called the Age of Fish. Stepping back and looking at the fossil record as a whole, the evolution of fish was one of the most important parts of a process called the Necton Revolution. Over the course of the Necton Revolution, animals moved away from the benthos where they first originated and invaded the water column above them. It was a long, gradual process that began during the Cambrian explosion, when early nectobenthic animals like Anomalocaris and Opabinia and others first evolved the ability to swim through the water just above the sea floor. Over the next 200 million years, evolution created more vertebrates and invertebrates like them that were powerful swimmers and predators. Marine life was no longer restricted to the sea floor as it had been in the past. The entire ocean was open for business. Of course, the Necton Revolution did not end with the age of fish in the Devonian. The Necton would experience other changes over time. During the Mesozoic, for example, large marine reptiles became the dominant predators of the Necton. These marine reptiles included Mosasaurs, Pliosaurs, Ichthyosaurs, and Plesiosaurs. Eventually, during the Cretaceous mass extinction around 65 million years ago, all of these marine reptiles went extinct. But their disappearance created room for the rise of some more familiar elements of the Necton. Whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Interestingly enough, if we humans are fish, so too are all of these marine mammals. Tetrapods, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals evolved from fish-like animals that invaded dry land sometime in the Paleozoic. The only difference between us and the whales, dolphins, and porpoises is that they went back to the water at some point in their history. So next time someone tells you that whales or dolphins aren't fish, go ahead and remind them that deep down, we are all fish. One just needs to look closely at our shared evolutionary history.